remember another family, it's um, Ken and Cindy. I don't know if they're following along, I don't think so, but they're enjoying warm weather in San Diego. Uh, we're hoping they come back soon. We're gonna have a warm spring, come back in February. They were in Mexico. Ah, they even went further south. Okay, well, say hi to them, but I don't think they're following because I haven't been giving them any paperwork, but we'll see. Uh, Lord willing, everything's going well down there for them, and they'll be back. A few weeks ago, they were in Boston. <laughs> oh, so they're traveling. They were, well, they went to San Francisco. They figured this would be around. Well, I feel better because it's cold back there. So. <laughs> okay, so we're recording. Check out. All right, number 27. Everybody's got a copy of that. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks for the push. 27. We need to read verses 1 to 6. So if somebody's going to read, make sure you got a mic in front of you. Who would like to do it? Okay, Paul. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. The, then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red rag, dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And, we, and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule with all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so there, so that there she would be during for 1,000 years. 260 days. All right, we've entered into a few figures of speech here, right? Yes. So, so people start getting very confused or distracted by, by some of this. Uh, again, you cannot speak English without using figures of speech. All right? It's just part of life, part of language. So you don't want to get all hung up when you find something you say, oh, I don't know what that means. That doesn't make any sense to me. It, it must be some kind of symbol. And so you start looking for, to figure out what is the symbol. Um, so as you look at this picture, we'll start in with the questions and see if we can make sense out of this, but we're not in a hurry, so we'll try to do the best we can. What appears to John here in verse 1? Great sign. Okay, a great sign appeared in heaven. Okay, that, that's significant. You want to keep that in there. So we looked up a couple words. The word great simply means... Mega. It's mega. It means... Big. Big. Very large. Okay, or large and what? Okay, can be significant. Excellent. Uh, okay, it might border on that. Um, but just in a strict definition, yeah, I know, they all do that. Something that's important. Um, but in this case, it, I translated it for you as something that's significant. A significant sign, an important sign, can't even carry the idea of extraordinary. But just the word great, if we have a mega sale, as Linda brought up there, it's just a large, great sale. It's significant. It stands out around uh, um, amongst all the other sales. So then the word sign, a great sign shows up here. 4592, what does that one mean? Authenticating mark. Okay, authenticating mark. Distinguishing mark. Some kind of distinguishing mark. Indication. It, it indicates it is a token. A symbol of something to come. Okay. It, a symbol of something to come. Okay, it, it could be future, but in the definition by itself, that it doesn't mean it's future. Okay. It's just some kind of proof, some kind of evidence, all right, is what the, the sign is. It's the same thing. You just can picture it. You're driving down the road, and you see signs, and they mean something. And they, they'll put them up. They'll take them down according to what the need is, but they're just trying to draw your attention to something that is important, um, some kind of... It's, it's an evidence that something else is going on there. It may say bridge out. Well, you can't see that the bridge is out, but the sign gives you proof or evidence that it is, that if you can trust that sign. So that's how it's functioning here. And then the word appeared. 3708 simply means? 
became something that was became visible. Okay, became visible, witnessed, something that you could actually see, perceive, behold. And so here's this great sign that appears. And who's it appearing to? A woman. No, that is the sign. To John. To, to John. You almost struck out. That was two strikes there. I know. That's terrible. But it's a, a, appearing to John. So he's just telling you what he's seeing. You, you can't blame him for it. You can't, you can't pull a lot out of it. He's simply telling you, I saw a sign. And the sign was this. What? A woman. And it's a great sign. And so who is she is the first question I threw out here. I just went right to the heart of the matter. What do I draw out of verse 5 that helps me to understand who this woman is? Okay, her son's going to rule over the nations, which we understand from Scripture points to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Okay, the promised one out of Isaiah 11. What else stood out here? How's he going to rule? Rod of iron. Psalm 2 brings out some of that about him, 7 to 9. And anything else stand out there? What happened to her child? He's caught up. What do we call that? What happens in Acts 1? Ascension. The ascension is what they refer to it as. He's, he's caught up. And so as you look at, at some of these features here, we'll get to those and fill them in in a moment. But at this point, we're talking about who the woman is. And so from verse 5, what stands out? What do you write in there about this woman? It, it's symbolic. It's a figure. But it's for who? Pat? Oh, okay. Okay, nation of Israel, because the nation of Israel is where this child came from. The promised Messiah came along down the um, lineage, uh, ultimately born in the, the promised location of Bethlehem, just outside of what city? Jerusalem, Jerusalem not far from Jerusalem. Many prophecies fulfilled uh, that put him in that category. So here's Satan who doesn't know when he's going to be born, and, and so he's um, going to position himself, as we'll see here in a moment, to deal with this child that's going to come, this Messiah, the one who's going to be the ruler over the earth. Who has ruled the earth up to this point? Okay, he's the God of this world. As far as a man, who's ruled over the whole earth? Nobody. So this is going to be unique when he ultimately rules. You've had great kingdoms, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persians, Greece, Rome, but they've never controlled the whole world. In fact, when you go into one of those time charts of what's going on in the world, and they guess, it's not super accurate, you realize the Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs, the many other civilizations and things that are going on are in other parts of the earth that aren't even affected by um, what's going on in Europe or Middle East. And so one day, Christ is going to rule all of the earth. And this is going to be fascinating, and only one individual is going to ever fulfill that. So what was the woman's appearance here? How is she described? What's her clothing? Clothed with the sun. What's the footstool? Moon is under her feet. And then what kind of crown? Crown of 12 stars. And this is a Stephanos which tells you it is equal to what? Victorious, some kind of crown of victory. And, and so when we looked at the sun, moon, and stars, and you look back, let's go ahead and go to Genesis 37. This is not going to be simple. And you have people debate some of this, so I, I don't want you to think it's just clear cut, but we're going to look at it, and I think it's pretty basic to understand what's going on here. Genesis 37. Verses 1 to 10. I'll go ahead and read this one. He says, and everybody got that? Genesis 37, verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph was 17 years old, uh, 17 years of age, when pastoring the flock of his brothers, with his brothers while he was still a youth. There's two strikes against him, Pat. <laughs> Along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel, also um, known as Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his sons, because he was the son of his old age. 
and he made him a very colored tunic. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he t told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. I'd love to be able to tell my brothers that, that story. <laughs> then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream, and he related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. Oh, you can hear the groans. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Something unique is going on here. So there's some background information. When you pull that up to what's happening here in Revelation 12, and you ask yourself with this story, he saw a vision of this woman, and she's clothed with the sun. So what could that possibly be a reference to? It can be a general picture of, of what? Brightness. Okay, it could just be brightness, some kind of brilliance. But what, how was it used back in Joseph's um, dream? Oh, I thought I heard somebody start to say something. That he was the son. That who was the son? That uh, uh, Joseph was the son. Okay. No. no. His oh, father. Yeah. His father was. Yeah, Jacob, Jacob or Israel was the son. Israel. And, and he recognized in the layout of how they presented that dream that he was going to be bowing down to him, whether it was the sheep or, or even as the son, that the authority was going to go to Joseph. Is that a good dream? Is it a true, true dream? Yeah, very true. But his dad and his mom and his brothers were not ready to receive it. So in this case, if the, the woman is clothed with the son, what may it be trying to bring up? Well, so I put that little equal signs in there, I leave a blank that I don't have to fill in. You have to fill in. No, we all have to fill in. What's the possibility of what's being brought up there? One. It could be a reference back to Jacob, all right? So what is she clothed with? The sun. The moon. Okay, what would the sun represent? God. I'm sorry? God. Okay, that, that'd be a, a good guess. Power. And it could be reference to that, because that seems what's coming out in the dreams. Like if you look at the dream of Joseph, the father and mother was the sun and the moon. Right, in the dream. Mm -hmm. So then here it could even be like this woman has a father and son there. The father and mother, like, she doesn't have a husband. Okay, like, how did the 12 tribes come together? Where did they come from? Abraham. Abraham. Who's the common denominator with the 12? Jacob. 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 Whether he had two wives or two different concubines, every child came from Jacob. He's the son in the sense that he is the one, and he's named Israel here, the one who wrestled with God. But um, the, the idea here is Israel's connection, when it actually became a nation of 12 tribes, was all wrapped around Jacob, if I could use that as a figure of speech. So I think that may be the simplest way I can put that. You, can, you will not find anybody taking a hard line, clear definition of what's going on here. It is definitely a symbol or a figure of speech, and what he's saying here is, I see Jacob involved in this woman as the son, if it goes back to Genesis 37. So just to hold that there. Don't, you don't have to believe me or accept all this. But let's move down to the second one. The moon is under her feet, under the woman's feet, and the moon in Jacob's dream is connected to Rachel. Rachel. Why would she be zeroed in on here? Why is she zeroed in on Jacob's dream? She's only the mother of two. Ten other children were not born from her. Why is Rachel the one that gets elevated in Jacob's dream? Well, isn't that the line that comes Jacob, uh, Joseph and Benjamin came from Rachel. Judah comes from Leah, which is kind of interesting. 
But it's, it's just fascinating that this is in here. I don't have simple answers for you. You're probably coming and saying, Jack will explain this and make total sense out of it. <laughs> Sorry. I have no problem with this being a reference, the woman being Israel. That to me is a no-brainer, just the way all of this comes about and what's being said. But how uh, clothed is actually a perfect tense, having been clothed with the son. This is a long-term relationship with the idea of being uh, connected to Jacob. The moon is under her feet, under this woman's feet. So Rachel is kind of a foundational aspect to this, which it is with Joseph and Benjamin. But then the crown here is on her head. What kind of, and how many stars does a crown have? Twelve. Twelve stars. And it's a crown of victory. So what has happened since Jacob, the twelve tribes, and the history of Israel? What has God given to Israel over and over and over again? It's victory. Who wanted to wipe Israel out? Lots of And specifically... Satan. Satan. Working through all those individuals, he keeps looking for ways to wipe them out. What did he do in Bethlehem right before the Christ was, or right after the Christ was born? He went and killed every child that was two and under, thinking that he could, there was no way the child would escape. But God had already told him to flee. The guesstimate there was the child probably wasn't even one, and so if you're the king and you're that jealous, and that fearful of another king rising up, you kill off babies, you just overdo it. Who cares? I hate the Israelites. It's no big deal to me. Wipe them out. So this is what had taken place, just from one incident of what had taken place. You see them over and over and over again trying to mess up the godly line. When you get into the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, and you see individuals, you see Gentile women, prostitutes brought in to the line. You see a lot of things that took place along the way, and yet... Israel comes out victorious over and over. And what's Israel going to do in the end? Come out victorious. Satan, her adversary, has been trying to take her out all through time. And guess what he does when he's cast to the earth, as you'll look at next week, Lord willing, and knowing he only has a short time, who's he go after? Israel. Chases a woman. She flees into the wilderness. This is a common denominator. It's what Satan is trying to do. So he's laying out this picture. She has been, uh, this woman, Israel, has been clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. As far as kind of a secondary brilliance, and to bring out even the idea of the brightness of this, the, the reflection of the sun. And then the crown on her head is a crown of 12 stars. These 12 tribes are victorious, is what it's basically picking or describing. These 12 stars uh, are appropriate things to put on a crown. Um, they're luminous bodies but they're, they describe these 12 tribes, and you, you and I would never describe the 12 tribes as being luminous bodies that you could be impressed with. When you go through the, law, the history of every single one of them, even Joseph with the, with the mini colored or um, very colored tunic was kind of a nasty little brother. And then Benjamin comes along and he has a unique role to play, but but he has this appearance of the woman, and what were the woman's activities? This also ties in and kind of clarifies some things. She was what? With child. With child, telling you she was pregnant. pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay? It, it may carry the idea of nearing term, because it also goes on to describe that she is in labor. Uh, move the parentheses for me. I didn't catch that. I've been trying to read these. But 5605 in labor means what? Louder, remember, we're trying to work travail. for childbirth. Okay. And another one? Travail. Okay, travailing, travail. birth pains. having birth pains, suffering in that regard. When do you have those? What do we call that? Labor. 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 And then when you get to the next one, she's in pain, 928. What does that one mean? Torture. Tortured. Drama. Good word to pick, huh? <laughs> and what? Drama. Trauma. Trauma. Tormented, buffeted. buffeted, straining. What part of labor is that? You're probably at hard labor. You're probably near term. You're pushing along with this thing. And then the next one, she's not just expecting. She's exclaiming. What does she do? She cried out. You look this one up. It means she was screaming, shrieking. How many men have been at the birth of a child? 
Oh, not as many as I thought would be here. Okay. Does, does this describe well what your wife goes through in the process? She doesn't remember any of it. You do, because she breaks one arm and you've got to change the positions. What's that, Dennis? I said there might have been some unnecessary words, too. Okay, we don't need to go into the details. But the shrieking, the screaming, and, and the, the, the torment, the bird pains travailing, all of that is part of labor. And why is that, according to Genesis? Part of the consequence of her sinning, her sin. disobeying God, and what, Pat? Her sin in the garden. Okay, her sin in the garden. And again, I'm not trying to control you too much, but I want to make sure we space out who's talking when, because that also disappears. That you're, it goes together and they can't hear it. I don't know if it's the microphones are not turned up loud enough or what the problem is, but we'll see if we can figure it out some year. But as she's going in here, you got this clear picture. She's near term. How did the devil know when she was going to give birth to the Messiah? He doesn't know the future. Well, he probably he heard the angel announcement just like she did. Okay, at the time when it was when it was happening yeah. or near term, how did he know for thousands of years prior? He didn't. He has the same thing we have. What is it? Oh, the Bible. He has the scriptures. The prophets spoke about what was coming. He knows those very very well. He he can read and speak. Hebrew, as we talked about that early, Greek, Aramaic. He has no trouble with any of these languages, whether it's um, classical or modern or, or uh, Koine or whatever the language level is. He understands it perfectly. He can dissect it perfectly. He knows the scriptures far better than we do. So he has that to go by. But how does he know it's getting close? One, the angels show up. What else? Which are uh, the, the trumpets, the, the bowls that have been opened? No, no, we're talking about the birth of the Messiah. Oh. Yeah, but he would have seen the previous signs, right? Okay, what are those? I'm looking for specifics. They were all ordered back to their birthplace. Okay, for a census, but that may or may not have anything to do with the birth of the child. God uses that. It was in Bethlehem. He knows it's going to happen in Bethlehem, so you can figure that, and again, we're going to get some things that are going to help stand out here to make sense out of some of this. So you can figure he's hanging around Bethlehem. He will be at the line of Judah. Okay. He knows the tribes, or does he? Does he know if you're a Gentile or a Jew? But how does he know that what lineage Jody is? Or does he? So there may be some things he doesn't know. The 144,000 are marked out, 12,000 from each tribe. So you, you kind of, um, you realize he learns things along the way as we do, as we watch this take place. But he, he doesn't know. He's given way too much credit, far more powerful than us. And that is put down. People make fun of the devil in a variety of ways without going into that. But at the same time, his uh, knowledge of the future doesn't have it. He's very limited. God puts restrictions on him on what he can and cannot do. You look at Job. So there are things going on. There's battles taking place. Michael the archangel is even going to defeat him in the end to where he gets kicked out of heaven. So there's a variety of things happening here. But as this birth nears, there's um, a picture there that you're looking at Bethlehem you're looking at a promised Messiah coming out of the tribe of Judah. You're looking at a male child, which would limit what's going on there. I don't know what he's able to know looking at an individual. I don't know if he can even look at a woman early on and tell you if she's pregnant or not. I don't know what angels are able to know on some of those levels. But they see her go to the doctor. They hear words spoken that she, oh, you're, you're pregnant. Or she exclaims, either in uh, positive terms or with shrieking that she's pregnant again, what, whatever it may be. So th he picks up on all of that. He can follow all of that. But I, I'm stressing this because they're stressing it here. They're going out of their way to point out that this woman, Israel, I believe, is ready to give birth. So how might we summarize this vision of the woman in these first two verses? What did you write down there? 
And make sure it's into the microphone. Very, very good. I brought, I put uh, the one who brought forth a male child to rule all nations. Okay. And who is that woman? If I summarize this vision. Rachel. Okay, it's going to be, ultimately it's going to be Mary, but, but generally it's going to be the nation of Israel because that's who the, the um, Messiah has come down to. He had to fit the, the, the genealogy of Matthew and Luke. Jeconiah is cursed, and yet he's in the genealogy as one of the kings. And you look in there and you figure out how God gave him the legal right through Joseph, but not the physical right because he lost that in being cursed as one of the kings. If this doesn't ring a bell. It, but there's just so many features. And you can see Satan coming in and trying to interrupt, 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 interrupt. He does not want a king being born who's going to rule the nations of the earth. So he's fighting it every chance he gets. And you could probably do a study, probably even write a book, if somebody wants to do that, on the, uh, the uh, resistance of the devil throughout the, the 6,000 year history. Well, not six, when Abraham comes along history of um, the nation of Israel and all that took place. And you probably would be amazed at the little things that you pick up along the way and find out, yep, there he is, there he is, there he is. So he's coming after this woman. So I put down here, Israel is being personified as a woman. And the nation of Israel here is laboring to give birth to the Messiah, and she is in hard labor. I just kind of wrote notes as I went along. Linda? Okay, very good. Ken? Is that where the term motherland comes from? I think of Germany when I hear that term, so I don't know where that, where that term came from. Before we move on to the next question, I, or the next section, I've got a question. <coughs> Underneath Genesis 37.9, uh -huh. it had 11 stars bow down. Well, the 12 tribes came from Jacob, so... Are you saying the 11, the 11 tribes bowed down to Joseph? Yes, the 12th star. The 11 are bowing down to the 12th. Mm -hmm. All 12 are represented there, but in that case, he's the one in the dream that's being um, submitted to, or not worshipped, but uh, what the term they use? Bow down. Yeah, just bow down, humbling themselves before him. When you get further along with this, now Joseph is part of those 12. He's one of the 12. And again, I know there's 18 or 19 different lists of the 12 tribes with a um, variety of different ways that they're listed. So I'm not getting hung up on that, but it's always 12. Whether you leave Dan out or not, whether you have Ephraim involved, however they mix up the tribes, leave out Levi, it's always 12. And this is what's being brought out here, these 12 stars. Told you I couldn't give you very good answers on this one. But I found some bad answers in some of the places I looked. So there's still a lot of confusion. I, I'm not confused here. I, I have no problem recognizing the woman as being Israel in general. But um, nailing it down to prove who the sun, moon, and star, uh, crown of stars are, it's, it's implied, and that's what I just gave you. So how about verses 3 and 4? Oh, another question. Well, to clarify my notes, woman is Israel, and the sun with the son is Jacob? It would be the one most closely associated with that term, Jacob? yeah. Jacob, okay. Rachel, and the 12 tribes. But back in Genesis, it's 11 that are bowing down to, jo to yeah. Joseph, the 12. So you go from the victim, the woman, and I, maybe I shouldn't have picked that, but I had to have a V, uh, because she doesn't really get, eh, she gets harassed severely. So I mean, all the babies that died by the, at the hands of the Romans. Just that example. There's a moan, moaning throughout Israel because of what happened there. Very, very sad. Um, but now you move to the villain. So in verse 3, what else happened to John? Another sign. Another sign. We talked about the sign being this mark or token, some kind of proof evidence, something that you wonder at, you take note at on the road, especially in a snowstorm when you see it and you can't read half of it. But there it is, you try to make it out, and sometimes you've even stopped and rubbed them off to make sure, it doesn't say bridge out, does it? Or whatever it may see. The sign's important to take in. So here's another sign in heaven, and how did John command his readers to respond? Behold, 
Behold, that word simply means take notice, strongly, not just advised, but commanded. Take notice is what's being here told to John. What was the sign in verse 3? The great red dragon. When you picture Satan in the Middle Ages, what does he look like? A great, kind of an upright dragon that has what? Horns. Horns. A tail. Pitchfork. And what? Horns. Okay, and the horns are showing there. So they picked up, they took this literally, it's, it's a symbolic picture of Satan himself. And so I ask you, who was he? You go to verse 9, it tells you right there. Revelation 12, 9. Who'd like to read that to a microphone? Someone hadn't had a chance yet? Going, going. Okay. Isaac. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. Okay. In the context, we're told who the red dra great red dragon is, and who is it? Satan, also known as the devil, the devil and serpent. serpent of old, referring back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, when that when that serpent came in there. Uh, okay, so you put all that on that line. What was the dragon's appearance? What was um, involving empires? Seven heads. That is equal to. Uh, seven world empires, generally speaking, when you go back. We'll look at some passages here to help make sense out of this. How about the kings having ten horns? The horns usually represent authority. So kings and authority would fit well here. So you have seven world empires. You have ten kings that are in authority at one time. And then the word authority here, I put on his heads were seven Diadems, and what were the diadems equal to? Crowns. crowns. What kind of crowns? Royal, Royal crowns. This is a different word from Stephanos up earlier. These are now diadema, which are royal crowns. So he's telling you that the seven um, heads or seven diadems on the heads are monarchs. These are kings that are ruling. And so he's kind of painting a picture there. They're all connected with the dragon. Who's been running world history as the god of this world for 6,000 years? The devil. The devil, Satan, the servant of old. It's been his empires. It's been his kings. Who's going to run things up to the very end when Christ comes back and, and battles against them? It'll be Satan, working specifically through the little horn, the Antichrist, who takes over and, and takes control of the ten horns. So you get the impression he doesn't show up until the end, and he has a small empire, but he's very powerful. Something along that line. So what were the dragon's activities? How, what was his influence? Aha, uh -huh, his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. What does that mean? What's, what, what did you find when you looked up the word tail? It means tail. Everywhere you looked, you found tail. So when you do that, then you go to the dictionary. And what does the dictionary tell you is a tail? Because that's all it's referring to is a tail. Appendage. An appendage. What part of the body? The Usually on the rear end, right? The backside. And the idea of this tail, if it takes, sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven, how's it being described? Huge. Huge, possibly, but also very powerful. powerful. All right, because we're going to go into this and try to figure out what's going on. You look at the word stars, 792, and this one's hard to find as well. Heavenly body. Okay, heavenly body, luminous body would be, because there's a, heavenly bodies that are planets, heavenly bodies that are asteroids, but in this case, it's a luminous body in and of itself. It produces its own light. Anything else you find out about stars? Just, I want you to check these out and realize there isn't much there. So they understood it to mean stars and to mean a tail. And so the, what was the impact of his tail? What did he do with these stars? He threw them or cast them to the earth. earth. Where were they before? 
The implication is they're in heaven. And what does this mean? He threw them to the earth. I know it means cast or put them on the earth, but what is it trying to tell you? Fallen angels. Fallen angels and limited to earth. Planet Earth. Explains partly why some of them left their domain and inhabited people. They're looking for escape. They have been limited. They have been thrown down to the earth. So typically what they picture these stars, and we'll go look at a couple of verses that will help bring some of this out. Again, hard to nail down. John is writing to really a Jewish audience because he uses over 300 uh, illustrations, quotations out of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. If you didn't understand the Old Testament, you're not going to understand the book of Revelation. And that's why so many people today get it so mixed up. Because they aren't going back to the scriptures as their commentary. They start looking to men. And men come up with all kinds of things, whether it's totally figurative or totally meaningless and, and amillennial, where it just never happens. And, and they turn it into whatever they want it to be. But this tale of the dragon, who is Satan, sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven. So look at 9-1, just to pick something within the book first, which is where you go when you try to find answers here. What do we read in Revelation 9-1? It's the fifth trumpet being sounded, and what do we see here? We like to read 9-1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Okay, what did we figure out when we studied that? First off, what pronoun does it, is used? Him. So it's pointed out that this star is a person. It's not a thing. It's from heaven. It had fallen to the earth. And we went in and studied that, and you probably don't remember any of it, right? It's not Satan here, but it's some kind of person. So right there, I'm understanding that even though it tells me that there are the, a third of the stars are swept away, it's some type of individual, um, some kind of personage, and uh, limited them to the earth. So let me give you a couple other passages. Look at, I don't know what order to put these in, um, 12, this will go back to 12, 8, and 9, just to grab it again from the context of where we're going to be. He says, um, Michael and his angels wage war with the dragon, dragon and his angels. So he mentions them right there. Doesn't call them stars, but we know the angels are there. And they were, they're waging war, and verse 8 says they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. heaven. That's an interesting comment. And the great dragon was, was thrown down. The serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole earth, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down or cast down with him. So it seems to kind of tie in, even in the context that it's referring back to Satan, that it's referring back to these fallen angels. But let me give you a couple others. Go back to Daniel chapter 8, as you kind of hold your spot here. Daniel is one of the major prophets, as it's called in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Okay? So if you're still learning the books of the Bible, it's the fifth of the big books, and right before the twelve little books. That are the minor prophets. You go to Daniel 8. Did I give this to you on your paper? Okay, I did not. Daniel 8, verse 10. I hesitate to take you down some of these rabbit trails. So I don't want to get you lost, but I will share it with you. Daniel 8, 10. What does it say? Well, read 9 and 10. That will give us a little more context. Okay, Rocky. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, exceedingly great toward the south. Um, uh, for the south, for the east, and for the beautiful land. He grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and he trampled them down. Okay, so who is the little horn? Which is what this, a rather small horn, he says in verse 9, verse 8. Um, uh, I lost it here. No, nope, that's just talking about the male goat there. So it goes down further following that. A little more about the horn. But anyway, what's the basic picture here? What is this rather small horn? Who's it supposed to be representative of? One of Satan's angels. Okay, that could be a possibility of what people think. But he's actually a person on earth. 
Antiochus. Some think it's Antiochus Epiphanes. Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry? Okay, it might lean toward that, but he had just shown up back in verse uh, 5 as part of the Medo Persian, uh, I mean the Grecian Empire. So they think it could be Antiochus Epiphanes, or it may actually be a reference to the Antichrist himself in the future. Again, a little fuzzy, don't want to lock down, but it refers to this great, or this small horn, that it grows up toward the host of heaven. Who is that in verse 10? Okay, we don't know. Could be a reference to the people of God as you look up into verse 24. His power will be mighty, but not his own power. He will, he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. So it, it could be some of that picture being brought out here. And again, I'm not trying to get you lost in the weeds. But it also says he'll cause some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth. That is not a reference to the luminous bodies that are floating around in the universe. Probably a reference to angels here again. Is the best we can understand and grab onto this. Another one, Isaiah. Back up to the beginning of the major prophets. Isaiah chapter 14. Again, none of these are crystal clear, but they're often taught, so I wanted you to at least be aware of them. Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 13. He's describing uh, this individual. Uh, King of Babylon is referred to in verse 4. And he switches over in verse 12. How ha you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I'm in Isaiah 14. Sorry. Verses 12 and 13. But this individual who was initially referred to as the king of Babylon, but ultimately it's Satan behind the king of Babylon, he's called the O star of the morning in verse 12, which again is a, a Satan. Some translations um, call him Lucifer here. This isn't actually a name, it's a description. Lucifer really shouldn't be in here, but again, I'm only confusing you. He says, you have been cut down to the earth, you who have, been weakened, who have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Who is that? Probably a reference to angels. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. All of those we believe is referring to Satan himself. The star of the morning who has been cut down to the earth. There's that reference again. You who have weakened the nations. So these may be prophecies about what's going to take place, tying in the term star, referring to Satan as the star of the morning, giving us reasonable understanding that the stars of heaven are probably referenced to the um, angels that come with him. And this passage here, they think a third of the, of the angels in heaven uh, fell with the devil. Hard to nail down any of this perfectly black and white but it's the best we can do at this point. So questions that I can answer. <laughs> that will limit your questions. I have to take you through this because we're trying to do the Bible study. If I was preaching through it, I would tell you what I thought and you don't have to think about it. You can just say, well, he's crazy or I agree or whatever you may put in there. But when we're studying through it, I want to make sure you understand what's going on. And some of it I'm just giving to you because at this point we don't have the time to run through every reference that talks about some of this. Okay, so how do we summarize this vision of the dragon? Jim. I see it as an overview of Satan from creation to the time of Christ. Okay, very good. He's personified as a dragon here. Yeah. Also interchanged with the term serpent. Anything else people want to put down there? In summary, Linda. Well, Okay, people think that has happened already. It will not happen until we're going to see next week. When he's finally cast out, he knows his time is short. He has a limited opportunity. And so that's coming, but it hasn't happened yet. Satan still has access to God. Demons still have access to heaven. This is where the war is going to take place. Notice that? Um, 
in verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon and his angels. They're still there. So in spite of what anybody might tell you, your study Bibles try to convey, oh, the, the devil's been kicked out a long time ago and his angels are kicked out. It's not what the Bible teaches. A lot of what I read to you earlier is still future. These are future things that are going to take place. This is a big deal. When he no longer has access, what, he, what can he not do, for instance, when it comes to Job 1 and 2? He's not accusing God day and night. And he's not accusing the saints. Okay, and pointing out their flaws and what they're obviously doing. None of you sinned this week, right? No. None of us gave him ammunition to use. I call it his bony little finger in God's face. Regina, are you volunteering? Will people of the earth, like us, know when there, the war is in heaven outside of Scripture knowing it? We no. Will that war taking place in heaven is just like anything else taking place in heaven right now. Unless you're there, if you've died and already gone to be with the Lord spiritually in your immaterial body or immaterial soul and spirit, then I don't know what you're going to see up there. But when um, That could be pretty spectacular in itself. But when you're down here on earth, no, we're not seeing that. When he comes down, he knows his time is short, but he's still in a spiritual realm. And so unless he inhabits someone like Judas, which is what he did at one time, um, you're not even seeing any kind of physical representation of him. Good question. Anybody else fill in? I put on the bottom there, I don't want, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Paul. No. Good observation. These are snippets. Um, the sign of the woman, the sign of the dragon, the war in heaven are three different things that are going on, not trying to put them in any kind of timeline. Why did they use the word then in 12.3? 12, 12.3, 12, when you look it up, it's chi. It's chi is a simple conjunction that just typically, it can be translated also a couple other ways, but typically translated and. It has nothing to do with time. It should not be translated then. It's just what some of the translations do. And, but this is critical. This is why, and I pointed this out to you before and in sermons going through here, the book of Revelation is not chronological. That's not how it was written. It's simply a series of visions that John receives. And it comes to an end in chapter 11, which we looked at last week. And now he's going back and picking up some details that are critical to understand what happened in the first 11 chapters and why things came to an end the way they did. That's because, one, that a, a child was promised to Israel, and that child was born. Also, there was a, an adversary called the devil who is um, seeking to take that child out in any way he can throughout the history of Israel. Never knew for sure when she was going to be born. He, the, even then, if he can tell when a woman's pregnant and he knew it was Mary, or he could listen in on the conversation with the, the angel, uh, Gabriel, when he showed up to Mary, and he's listening in, and he goes, oh, it's time! Because Gabriel told her what was going to take place. I don't know if he gets privy to those conversations. But at this point, he's very limited. But until then, he's trying to head it off, head it off, head it off, whatever he can do to stop it, to mess up the line of Israel. To get rid of the tribe of Benjamin, altogether, if possible. So you, you can picture all those things. But he gives you these snippets. They're all important. One, two, three, four, part of four, and then um, the rest of four on down as he goes into the next section we're going to look at with study number 28. So don't let people give you a chronological view of the book of Revelation. It is rare. It's in there once in a while, but it's rare when it says then and uses the appropriate Greek word to tell you this followed after this. Then this, then this. It's in there, but not very common. Any other questions? So I just put down here and summarize, Satan is being personified as a dragon. He has fought God since the garden using world empires and their kings and using fallen angels to carry out his evil schemes. That's all I put down there. You could have written a number of things, some of you did. Mine is neither right um, nor wrong, because you can't, you can't judge me on that one. I just put down what I thought it meant. So some of yours may have been more right than mine, but that's, that's besides the point. So what happened next? in this vision. Now we're in this one vision with the dragon. 
And I'm saying next, just next in the text. I'm not trying to, I probably shouldn't put that in there because I'm going to confuse you. But he's, um, the dragon stood he's getting a vision the all the way through the book. That's all I'm saying. In this vision, the vision in the book of Revelation, what's the next part? Okay. The dragon stood before the woman. Okay. The dragon stands before the woman. The word stood there is what? Anybody look that up? He stands ready. Okay, he stands ready. It's a definition. He's what? Placed himself. Okay, places himself. Established. Establishes. Fixes. Sets. In, your, in the translation here, I said he's positioning himself. And I think that, is that what you just said, Linda? Placing himself. Oh, placing himself. Okay. I put on there he's positioning himself because he is getting ready. It's kind of like um, he's the catcher. And God's the pitcher, and here comes the ball. All right? And he wants to make sure, yeah, Steve, right. And he wants to make sure he's there. So he's positioning himself. Uh, he's fixing, establishing, setting himself. And then the little word before, what does that mean? 1799. Prior. Okay, it can mean potentially prior, but what's, what's it actually mean in the Greek? In, in the sight of? In the presence of? In the face of? The in front of, in, in face of. It's bringing out the idea of the face. So he's telling you that he establishes himself before what? The face. The woman. Before the woman. All right. So he is ready. You can picture him literally being in the city of Bethlehem. You can see him there. Here the angels all come and announce the birth of this child. Where's the devil? He's nearby, and he's already scheming. Now, how do I get rid of him? Because what's he do? What's the first thing he does? Kills all the babies. As soon as he can, yeah, he gets them stirred up. The kings come in looking for the baby. Herod finds out about it, and he wants them all killed off. So he gets information to the bad guys. That's why you have secrets out there in society, in your national intelligence, and whatever you may do, which aren't very secret anymore. People are blabbing everything to everybody. And so in the same sense here, Satan has his ears out, trying to take in whatever he can. As you look at the next part here, what was the condition of the woman? About to give birth. What does that mean? She's miserable. Baby's coming. Baby's coming. She's at full term. She's what? No, I just said, here comes the baby. Here comes the baby. It's, it's right at that time is what he's trying to bring out. Why was he there? So that when she gave birth, she might devour her child. That's pretty nasty. What does the word devour mean? Consume. Consume is the general idea. Vine brought out consume. Swallow. Swallow like an. It is finished. Okay, eat all of it. And Vine brought out this term is describing to consume like an animal. How does an animal eat? Just ripping it to shreds. This is kind of the idea he's trying to put behind this consuming. Eating like we would say, eating like a pig, but pigs aren't even as bad as this. How does John describe the delivery of this child? Verse 5. First one involves the incarnation. She gave birth to a son, a male child. Isn't a son a male child? Why, why is he having to repeat this here? What's he bringing out? I'm sorry? Okay, the promise of a male pros posterity, specifically a son, we on is the idea of this connected um, to Israel, connected to the father might even be, but, but he is a male. Going out of his way, John is, to make sure you understand this is the Messiah. <laughs> this is the promised one. What was his future position on earth? What's he say there? To rule all the nations. All right. To rule all the nations. And the word rule there, 4165, is not what we typically think of. It's the word shepherd, shepherd which means to... Firm oversight. Okay, we're getting a bunch of them. Firm oversight. Firm oversight, but more, more kindly. Take care of. Take care of by Sheep. feeding, mm -hmm. nourishing. That a kind of an idea. The word shepherd is also the word for... Pastor. That's what a pastor does with God's sheep. How will he rule? With a rod of 
Rod of iron, the word rod there is simply a staff or a scepter. What could a staff or a scepter be made out of? Could be a stick, some kind of wood. Could be a, a branch would be that type of wood. Could be a metal. Could be metal, but it may not be iron. This one is iron. Why would it be described as a rod of iron? You can't break it. You can't break it. Okay, it's very, very strong. It's, it's not breakable. I was watching a show on um, basically swords, and they were talking about how they broke so easily because of how they made them early on. When you get a really well-made quality knife today or sword, it's been heat tempered as part of the process, but, but prior to that, it has been beaten and beaten and beaten out flat, folded over on itself, beaten and beaten and beaten. I, one guy had a sword that he made, it had a thousand layers of steel. Because what they're doing, every time they lay it and beat it, it pushes out the impurities. And it tightens it even tighter and tighter and tighter. Once he gets it to where he wants it to be, then he fires it or he um, tempers it by dropping it into oil or cold water. There's different features of what they're trying to do there. But early swords broke. How would you like to be in the battle with your sword and you whack another sword and it breaks down and you got this little bitty dagger? Your first thought is, run! <laughs> or find a sword from somebody else that had dropped it on the ground. But duck is another word I think I would come up with. So his rod is not going to be breakable. He's not going to be taken down. He will rule and he will not be defeated. This is a picture of this child. Satan knows that. He knew it in the Garden of Eden. How did he know it in the Garden of Eden in chapter 3? What was said in verse 15 of Genesis? What's the whole verse say? You can read it. I always, there's always an open book exam with me. Genesis 3.15. What's the promise? Early on. And he's talking to the serpent. What do you read it? Jim? And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. All right. So the clash of the two, talking to the serpent, bringing up the term of the woman, which isn't just a reference to Eve. It's a reference to the genealogy that will come from her, that woman. Ultimately, Israel, when it comes to the birth of Christ. And they're going to, have a, they're going to injure each other, but... Christ, or Christ is going to be a wound in the heel, which Achilles' heel, you can almost picture the idea that he will become a man and he will be limited to a body forever and ever. Do you feel limited in any ways as you get older? <laughs> Somebody said something on the radio today and I wanted to smack them. Because there was a young person really just bragging about their ability to do something. And I'm sitting there talking to the radio. I said, that's going to go away. <laughs> you shouldn't be bragging. You're going to lose it. Can you imagine God taking on flesh and not being everywhere present again? He'll still be all-knowing, all-powerful. He'll still be all these features. But he's, there was a wound that took place because he took on flesh and died as a man. And I think it ties in with that idea. But Satan's wound is going to be on the head. When you, when you do a head wound to a snake or to a serpent, it is fatal. If you want to kill one, make sure you take out the head. Sometimes even chopping them in half, they can still bite. They don't jump very far, but they can still bite. Sorry. So then comes the ascension shows up here. Her child was caught up. You looked up this word, 726. Interesting word. Means snatched away seized, carried off, caught up, kind of pictures like almost a rapture to us, the same idea. But this is a description of the ascension. When he's taken off planet Earth, you don't see him going, uh, uh. there's no effort being put out by Christ. He literally, God the Father, takes him. This is the picture of what he's trying to describe here. Snatched away. Where did he go? Caught up to... God and to his throne. throne. What does it mean, caught up to God? Under God's protection. Okay, he doesn't need protection. He's, he's God. But on that same line, why was he going back to the Father? What did he tell Mary when she clung to him? I go to prepare a place. Okay, that comes in chapter 14. <laughs> Did he finish what he was doing? 
Ooh, I had the verse, and now you've said so many things, I, now I'm losing the verse. <laughs> Stop clinging to me, I must go to my father. Why was he going to the father? What was he presenting? What was he going to enter into and do in the tabernacle or the temple in heaven? He was going to present his blood. The sacrifice would be accepted. If he goes to God, he's accepted. Remember what he just took on? The sin of the world. Why is he able to go into the presence of God? Because that sin was paid for, atoned for. Again, general, we're running out of time. So what did you put there? I just put sacrifice accepted. And, and, and then where did he go to his throne? Why did he go to his throne? His position is accepted. His, yep. his role, he takes his role, his rightful position on the throne, reigning. Jim? Uh, I noted there that that's something Satan desires, too. Yes. In this whole picture. Isaiah 14. Yeah, he wants to be like that. I will, I will, I will. He can't be above him. He'll be above the clouds, which, again, is a reference potentially to something. But I'll be like God. He, there's nothing higher. So he knows that, and he says it, states it correctly, even as the picture there in Isaiah 14. So he's, uh, his sacrifice is accepted, his, his kingship is accepted as he sends to his role as king. And what did the woman Israel do long after the birth of the child, the Messiah, in verse 6? Fled into the wilderness. She fled into the wilderness. That's going to be something that takes place still future to us. This idea of uh, fled means she escaped. escaped. Ran away. She ran away. What does Matthew 24 tell you about this? What, is, what did Jesus tell them to do? When they, when the, Flee into the wilderness. To flee into the wilderness, or that word can mean, I make sure I, I keep forgetting if I put them in here or not. It can just mean desert. They debate that. Where is she going to flee to to be in that area? And there's all kinds of debate. Um, I don't know that I have to debate it. It's going to take place just fine. Many, some think that she's going into Petra. But in modern day warfare, Petra is useless. You realize that? What is open? All of those slits and those narrow, narrow little channels with modern-day warfare, you just take one little cruise missile, drop it on in there. It's, that's not how they're getting protected. It, they don't need Petra. They need God. But you also realize that the, um, the Satan cannot get to Moab, Edom, and Ammon. What, is, what are those three nations, old-time nations, what are they going to be in the future? What are they right now? The modern country of Jordan. You look at Jordan. It's kind of weird where they come up with these patterns. But Moab, um, Edom, and Ammon are all part of modern-day Jordan. And Satan cannot go there. And they're also protected. You'll see them brought up in Daniel. And I'm already out of time, and I can't bring up all this stuff. But there, she escapes. She runs away. But she runs away. What if they don't run? They're going to perish. What did Jesus tell them to do in Matthew 24? He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get the things out of the house. Let him who is in the field not turn back to get the cloak. But what are those who are with child to those who nurse babes? Pray your flight is not in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as not occurred. Satan's going to go after her with the great tribulation. And God is telling Israel to run. And it's up to her to physically depart. Dennis? I don't know if we had brought this up before, but I'm wondering if, if a woman is with child when... If a woman is with child during um, the end times... Uh, I, I mean, it just makes it far more difficult for her to travel. If you're with a nursing child, you, you have other complications. So, but, but when we're with Christ, is, are they going to be parted? Or, I mean, I, if if some Jewish that. women are pregnant or have newborn babies, it's going to be very difficult for them to travel. That's all it's trying to bring up. Okay. So pray it's not at that time. Um, God allows them to ask and, and make preparations for this. So the preparation here, the word prepared means what? Made ready. God had made ready. He had arranged a place for them. Don't know what that is. It's in the mountains. But that's what you have. When you go from Jerusalem and you head toward the Dead Sea, it is a mountainous region, but it's a desert region as well. And so, what's the purpose here? So that she may be nourished for, for 
1260 days. And the word nourish means, again, we looked at this earlier, but what? Fed. Fed. Provided, provided for. Provided for fattened. Sustained. Taken care, care of. Vines brings out the idea, carries the idea to make to grow. This is food that's designed to help you to be growing. And that's what the word has behind it. You, you may be fed some things when you're newlyweds and your wife is first cooking for you. You may be fed, but are you able to grow from it? That's the question. And vice versa. We joke about this a lot. I'm not picking on my wife. She never gave up. She finally, I just left the kitchen. I could not compete with her and her ability to cook. But when we first got married, she couldn't boil water. And so um, it, was, it was a fun transition. We used, her first loaves of bread were great door stops. Man, they, would, they were hard, heavy, and lasted forever. But don't eat them. That was very dangerous. So it, as you're looking at this picture, Israel's going to have to get out of there. And you're kind of going, God, why don't you just do it? Why don't you just supernaturally pick her up and put her somewhere? Because he's never done that. Think about the history of Israel. All of Satan's attacks. Go back to Egypt. Go back to the... The attacks of Pharaoh having to cross the Red Sea over and over and over. Her life has been a pain. And it's been a pain because she's not doing what God wants her to do. Golden calf right after the Red Sea. So you're, you're just looking at all this stuff and realizing the struggle. But the fact is, God says you're going to work with me. Guess what he does with believers today? He doesn't make life easy. He says there's no temptation taking you but just to common to man, and God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it, to go through it. Not to escape it. That's not what the word should be translated there. It doesn't mean that. He doesn't do that because we grow from those things. We watch him work, but we have responsibility. That's why we need to read our Bibles. We need to pray. We need to obey and not sin. Can't believe how many times as a pastor and feel sorry for Isaac because he's got a lot of this coming. He's already had some, I'm sure. Where people come to you and their life's a mess. And they, they come and they want you to fix it all. Like Humpty Dumpty and they bring a bag of broken up eggshell. And they say, here, put this back together. And you, it's hard because you don't want to tell them, can't happen. You're I not going to look right. We'll get the egg back together, but it's not going to look like what it looked like before. And it's never going to function like it did before. And why? Because you sinned. What were you doing up on that? What was he on? On the wall. What were you doing on the wall? God had told you many times, don't get on the wall. I'm sorry. I'm getting beyond things I should close off. All right. Great passage. Figures of speech. Some things hard to nail down, but I think it's pretty, pretty clear once you go through it what's basically going on here. Father, we are thankful to you that you have laid out in this book some details that go back to what is going on in the first 11 chapters. Where um, Israel came from, where the Messiah came from, why Satan hated uh, that baby so much, and then ultimately leading to this war in heaven where Satan himself is finally kicked out that we're going to look at next week. We thank you that you're in control. We thank you that right now all around us in this room is a spiritual warfare going on. It's, it's not a battle for us against flesh and blood that we really have to focus on. It's the spiritual. And so we need to resist the devil. We need to take our stand. We don't need to fight him or run from him. We just need to stand in your truth and in your will, doing what you've called us to do. And he'll flee, just as he did with your son. As we answer with scripture in that stand, it is written, it is written, it is written. He'll flee away. He doesn't want us to get stronger. He doesn't want us to be in your word. He doesn't want us to see the victory that comes through your son. So help us to not give up. Help us to look to you and to walk by your spirit and to make a difference in this world and not think that it's hopeless. And I thank you for the privilege of serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. I got carried away. That was kind of a sermonette in there, sorry. <laughs>